After a killing spree that left young women in fear for their safety and authorities baffled, Ted Bundy had finally been captured. During the 1970s, the notorious serial killer had murdered dozens of women on a rampage that took him across the Pacific Northwest and eventually to Florida. But on November the 8th, 1974, one woman was able to escape his grasp. Carol DeRanche, then 18, was shopping at a mall in Murray, Utah, when she was approached by Bundy, who was posing as a police officer. Bundy told DeRanche someone had attempted to get into her car and asked her to come with him to the Murray Police Department to sign a complaint. The two drove off in Bundy's Volkswagen Beetle, but eventually pulled over and Bundy tried to put handcuffs on DeRanche. DeRanche said Bundy managed to get one handcuff on one of her wrists and threatened her with a gun. She jumped out of the car and was able to flag down a passing vehicle. An elderly couple drove her to the police station where she was able to give police a description of Bundy and his car. On August the 16th, 1975, Utah Highway Patrol Trooper Bob Hayward was finishing his shift log when he saw a Volkswagen Beetle parked in front of the house where he knew two young women lived. Hayward said he put his headlights on bright and Bundy took off. After being chased by Hayward, Bundy eventually pulled over, and Hayward began questioning Bundy about his car, where he found handcuffs, a ski mask, and pantyhose with holes cut in it. Hayward arrested Bundy and charged him with evading an officer and having possession of burglary tools. Bundy was later put into a police lineup, and though he made attempts to alter his appearance, Durant was able to identify him in the lineup as the man who attacked her. Meanwhile, detectives had found evidence linking Bundy to the Colorado murder of Karen Campbell. Karen, a 23-year-old nurse, had been found murdered near Snowmass, Colorado in February 1975, a month after she went missing while vacationing with her fiancé at a ski resort. Bundy was charged with the first-degree murder in the death of Campbell. He was transferred from Utah to a jail in Aspen, Colorado to stand trial. Bundy was allowed to assist in his own defense, so he had the right to use the law library, which was located on the second floor of the same building as the Pitkin County Courthouse. The judge decreed that Bundy didn't need to wear lag shackles or handcuffs, so he was allowed to walk freely into the courtroom and to the law library. At the time of his incarceration at the Pitkin County Jail, Bundy had thought a great deal about escaping but he didn't know at the time if he had the guts to actually do it. On June 7th, 1977, Bundy finally took the opportunity while locked in the law library by sheriff's deputies. The guard went outside for a cigarette. The windows were wide open, and with the fresh air blowing through, Bundy decided to make a go for it. He walked up to the window and jumped out from the second story under the ground and went running straight for the mountains. About 10 minutes after Bundy escaped, the guard realized Bundy was missing and roadblocks were immediately set up at each end of town. Every car was searched, leaving Aspen. Bundy fled into the mountains where he broke into a cabin. Staying for several days, Bundy would eventually walk back into Aspen where he stole a car that was unlocked and then the keys in the ignition. A deputy pulled over Bundy after he spotted the car weaving along the road. As six days after his escape, Bundy was back in custody. Bundy was then moved to the Garfield County Jail in Glidwin Springs, Colorado. In his cell was a grate that had not been secured. There was also a light fixture that was due to be welded, but had not been in the time Bundy was behind bars. Thoughts of escape quickly enveloped Bundy's mind. In the months he spent at the jail, Bundy began losing weight. John Brown, Bundy's then defense attorney, took notice of his sudden weight loss, but didn't think too much of it. On December 30th, 1977, Bundy's plans came into action. Bundy carved an opening that was in the ceiling of his cell wider than it was so that he could fit through. And he arranged some law books and pillows to make it look like there was a body in the bed. Crawling through the ductwork of the jail, Bundy came down into one of the jailer's apartments who wasn't there. He put on civilian clothes and simply walked away into the night. For the second time, 
Bundy managed to escape. So as Bundy escaped the jail in Colorado, he steals a car, drives it to Denver. From Denver, he flew to Chicago. After he gets to Chicago, he takes a train to Ann Arbor, Michigan. He steals another car there. He drives the car down to Atlanta, and then finally he took a bus here to Tallahassee, Florida. So he's driving around in Tallahassee, Florida, and of course uh, he needs to find a place to live so he can set up shop, so to speak, and again, begin his ultimate reign of absolute unbridled terror. No one really knows the true reason why he chose Tallahassee, possibly because he liked younger girls and this area is a uh, college neighborhood. So across the street at 409 West College is where Bundy rented a room from on January 7th of 1978. Now, right next to this building with the four white columns, you're gonna see an empty lot, which was turned into a parking lot. So this was where Ted Bundy lived for a few weeks back in 1978. Now, in April of 2001, his old apartment caught fire probably some uh, homeless vagrants. And then it caught fire again in uh, December of 2002. And finally, they just knocked it down and made it into this parking lot right here. And I'm pretty sure the residents of the neighborhood were fine with it just disappearing because it just stood here as a reminder of what uh, Ted Bundy did and where he lived so forth and so on. So now we're gonna take a quick walk to the sorority house where he killed two women a week later after he rented the room here. So on the very, very early morning hours of January 15th, 1978, uh, Ted Bundy is walking the two blocks from his rented room back on College Avenue. And for who knows what reason he walks up to this sorority house right here. This is the Chai Omega house. And uh, this is, a, of course, a house where girls that go to school at Florida State live at. So he breaks in through the back door. And with him, he's carrying a wooden club. And immediately, once he enters the house, he starts bludgeoning girls sleeping in their rooms to death. He bludgeoned four girls in this house. Lisa Levy, Margaret Bowman, Karen Chandler, and Kathy Kleiner. I'm really not sure how long Bundy was in this house bludgeoning these girls, but eventually somebody woke up and scared him off, and then he runs out the front door down the street. So in the ensuing chaos, 911 is called. The police come, paramedics, the fire department, and they check for the victims. When the paramedics first arrived, they noticed that Karen Chandler was in the front of the house, bleeding profusely from her face. Every bone in her face was broken. Her skull was fractured. Karen Chandler also received similar injuries. When they checked the rooms of Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy, they found them in their beds, absolutely covered in blood and unresponsive. So as Bundy runs out of this house, he's running down the street. Mind you, he's still clutching the wooden club in his hand. Now you would think that after all the screaming and all of the turmoil that he caused, murdering two women, you would think that he would go back to his rented room and hide out until the coast was clear and then flee town. 
No, he actually didn't. He proceeds to run a couple more blocks down the street and breaks into another house where a student, Cheryl Thomas, was living at. And as all of the firefighters, paramedics, police are in front of this house, apparently in his brain, the coast is clear to keep on killing. So he finds Cheryl Thomas in bed, starts beating her with the same wooden club that he used to murder those two girls. She ended up surviving the attack, but because the attack was so vicious, uh, she ended up uh, with permanent hearing loss. Sadly, these two murders committed by Ted Bundy would not be his last, as there was one more murder that he committed, and that was 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, which some people would say was the most brutal murder of all. So right now we're gonna drive a couple hundred miles down south to Largo, Florida. We're gonna go visit the graves of Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy. And we arrive first here at the grave of Margaret Elizabeth Bowman, January 6th, 1957 to January 15th, 1978. She died just about a week past her 21st birthday. She was born in Hawaii. And if she were still alive today, she would be 62 years old. She would probably have grandkids and talking about her retirement and where she's going to live and buying her grandchildren Christmas gifts, so forth and so on. I don't know who this is right here. I'm going to go ahead and just guess this could possibly be her father. He was born in 1930, died 2015. Uh, Jackson Bowman III. And there's another Bowman grave right here. Jackson Harrison Bowman, born in 1904. So this could be the grandfather. And here we are about four miles away at the Chapel Hill Memorial Cemetery. This is the grave of Lisa Levy. This is the other young woman that Ted Bundy murdered on those early morning hours of January 15th, 1978, two weeks before she was to turn 21. And Lisa is buried next to who I believe is her mother, Henny Levy. It's horrible to have to bury your child and to have it so to where it was such a public killing. You know, let me tell you something. I, Guys, let's not forget Ted Bundy escaped from jail twice to come out and kill Lisa Levy, Margaret Bowman, and Kimberly Leach. He should have been rotting in jail for the rest of his life. But a bunch of jail guards at two different jails in Colorado, inept morons, definitely have blood on their hands. It's one thing to escape jail, all right? And then when you got him, let him do it again. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Whoever worked at that jail, either of those times he escaped, I hope you watched this video and I hope you think to yourselves because you were part of the problem, especially if you were running the jail. The higher ups definitely should have been fired. I don't know about any kind of criminal charges, but definitely should have been some firings going on over there to let that scumbag escape and to commit more murders. And you know what? Who knows? He was he had escaped for quite some time. There could be other murders where the body was never found. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know how many women Ted Bundy killed because he said whatever he wanted to say. It could have been 150. Who knows? This guy was a, a psychopath. And this woman, along with Margaret and Kimberly, they should already have been grown up, working their careers, 
married kids, all that stuff, and that was all snatched away by a POS scumbag who should have never, ever, ever been allowed to escape the first time, let alone the second time. At the end of the day, three senseless murders that should have never, ever happened if it wasn't for the inept work of those jailhouse guards back in Colorado. Hopefully, it never happens again where somebody escapes a prison or a jail to commit their heinous acts. A recipe to all the victims in this video and all of the victims that died, were killed and murdered by the hands of the evil, disgusting, and violent Theodore Bundy. Live but not live, but still alive. By the grace of God, I am Lamont at Large. Thank you for watching my video. I will see you, of course, on the next one. God bless. Peace out.